this particular piece is called the minor third ratio. Quite simply, this length is five units and this one is six. Those units can be anything, centimeters, inches, miles, whatever. That corresponds to the musical note called the minor third. And it's supposedly the saddest sound that a composer can come up with to create a sense of melancholy or sadness in the listener. So if you have a piano or a guitar or violin and one of the string lengths is this and the other one is this and you play them together, you'll hear that. So artists and architects through the centuries have taken musical ratios like one to two, two to three, three to four and so on and are able to create a series of rectangles. By using that, you're creating a certain kind of harmony in the geometry that otherwise would not be there. I have a whole series of minor third pieces that I've been working on for the last 10 years. I find it's not sad at all. You know, it's very, very energetic and full of possibilities. Uh, this triangle is called a Serlio triangle, S-E-R-L-I-O, after the Renaissance architect who created a series of triangles that had certain numerical relationships. Each of the three sides belongs to one of the three major families that you can find in design, art, and architecture. Musical ratios, the golden section family, and the square root rectangles. This particular piece, I've divided it here so that there's a triple square on the left and a double square on the right. Numerically, symbolically, five is considered a feminine number, number of petals in a rose, for example. Six is considered a masculine number, it's inorganic. So this is kind of like a marriage between those two numbers. Three plus two is five, and then two times three is six which are the two numbers in the ratio. It's kind of unique in that way too. I'm always trying to find a way to make the grid complex enough that it's interesting, but not complex enough where it starts to become too disorderly. I'm always working with order, chaos, and disorder. Those three states of once you have disorder, you can never go back to order again. It's what happens in the universe as well. So I'm always working with those three possibilities within my work. It's always difficult to bring color into a geometric grid and have it work well. You don't want to make a mistake. <laughs> Imagine going in trying to erase any, any of this at this point. So. One of the interesting things about this particular relationship, this particular ratio, is the, the great number of possibilities that exist once you establish that perimeter and then begin to go inside. It's, it's quite remarkable. There's a lot to pick and choose from once you set up the grid, the basic grid. This drawing was done when I was in art school in the 60s. Uh, my father had just died and this was my uh, portrait of him um, looking into a mirror, into a sacred space. I found a love for geometry even at this early stage of my development and I think it's seen here in the frame and the mosaic table within this surreal setting. Uh, the objects above were just me riffing uh, about, I guess, the passage of life and death. This is a piece canvas. Actually, it's linen. It's covered with traditional gesso and then oil and silver point uh, were applied to that ground. So the gray lines that you see, some are graphite and some are silver point. Uh, because the ground had white lead in it, 
I was able to use a silver point drawing tool uh, for some of the lines that you see. Uh, this is one of my favorite pieces. It's a double golden section rectangle uh, with a Maltese cross in the center. This is one of the first pieces that I did when I came to California in 1988. This is 1989. Sometimes I'll do watercolor and then see what I can find in the watercolor. I put this outside to dry and the California sun burned this cotton paper a little bit. So this kind of amorphous pattern shape above this very geometric piece below called Nautilus in a Landscape. Sometimes I like to balance opposites and this one I think worked out really well. Uh, this is from a series of works that I've been busy at work with over the past three years called Thales series, All the Rectangles of the World. Any point on a half circle when connected to the ends of the diameter always makes a 90 degree angle. That point's movable and no matter where I move it I can always get a 90 degree angle. And that means that if I do the same thing in the other half of a circle, in a full circle, I can put all the rectangles of the world in it. So I did about 120 pieces of work, maybe about 60 finished pieces, and a couple hundred studies with that theory, that theorem by Thales. There is an angle called the ideal angle, and plants use it so that the leaf distribution around the stem of the plant will get as much sunlight as possible. That angle is actually the golden section of a circle. There was no construction for it. So by doing some experimentation and kind of investigating what possibilities were there, I was able to come, according to my mathematician that does all the proofs and studies because I'm not good with geometric proofs, I came within four ten thousandths of a degree of correct in figuring out this angle. Um, that's a golden section rectangle um, and then you can see the pentagon that results when I take the long side and drop it into the center. That triangle that you see is one of the five triangles in a pentagram. This is one of the minor third ratio pieces that I was talking about in the studio. The five to six rectangle is here and then I have the Serlio Helicon triangle in the center. And quite simply, I just built squares on all three sides of the triangle and then just let the geometry guide me as to what I was going to do. Sometimes I'll use existing architecture. In this particular case, the triangle that you see down the bottom is the elevation of the Great Pyramid at Giza. Um, there's a smaller version of it right here. This is called the square root of the golden section. It's quite amazing how this specific ratio likes to reproduce itself almost in any position at any size within the perimeter of the rectangle. So you'll see another square root phi rectangle there, another one here, 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 here. And I could keep on going with it, but you get the idea. It's also the ratio that we find in the chambered nautilus shell. The, each one of the chambers gets larger or smaller by a fixed number, which is the short side to the long side of this rectangle, which is about 27% more on the long side than it is on the short side. One of the most beautiful ratios we find in the natural world as well as the man-made world. This piece resulted from me taking the ratio of the northern wall of the king's chamber which is this rectangle here. It looks pretty much like a square. It's very close to a square, but isn't exactly. I also have started to break the picture plane, the perimeter of the rectangle, to suggest that geometry goes on for forever. This is one of those instances where it's verging on chaos. There, it's, it, it became so complex that I was afraid I was going to lose the aesthetics, the beauty of this particular piece. So it's always a trick to know when to stop. I think I stopped on time with this. <laughs>
In geometry, a lot of the ratios that we find come from the square. The parts that we find inside the square, it's diagonal, it's halves, it's fractional parts, and so on, produce different families of ratios that have been used throughout history by artists and architects and designers. They don't usually get along with one another. Um, they're, they're not harmonious. They're incommensurable, unable to be measured together. This particular piece was the result of me looking at what I could possibly find in one family of ratios and bringing it into another family. Was there a link between the two families? And to my knowledge, I don't think anyone's ever found this before. This vertical caesor or break uh, is at the golden section of the width of the rectangle. And on the right side, you'll find uh, members of the golden section family here. And over here, you'll find ratios that are related to the square root rectangle series, which comes from a square and it's diagonal. And what I did, I found that if I take the diagonal and move it out, I'm able to produce what's known as a square root of two rectangle, which comes up to here. But then if I take it on around to the other side, I found that I was also able to begin to produce the ratios that are in the golden section family. So what you see is me taking the square, square root of two, square root of three, square root of four, square root of five, and taking them over to the other side to produce members of the golden section family. So those arcs that you see are me just simply moving diagonals from one quadrilateral over to a quadrilateral that's in the other family. There are times when I like to move things around so that I'm not restricted to horizontal and vertical and find relationships that may exist in that shifting of position and orientation. And this is an example of one of those uh, experiments. Sometimes I do geometric analyses of existing architecture, floor plans, elevations, and paintings. This particular painting is called the Allegory of Geometry, which is in the Legion of Honor here in San Francisco. I did a geometric analysis. If it's called the Allegory of Geometry, my assumption was that the painter must have used a geometric grid for the placement of all the representational images that we find within the composition. And indeed, I did find a lot. Um, this is just one of maybe 10 or 15 different analyses that I did. Just very briefly, her eye is at the golden section of the width of the painting. There's much more to it, but we'll just go with that. There are times when I will make a discovery and include text with it. And this is an example of that, where I found a relationship between the equilateral triangle and again, the elevation of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And there is a geometric construction that brings the two of them together and marries them. This is an example of the most recent of my works. We talk about being alone in the universe or there are other beings in this universe. Do they look like us or not like us? And what do they look like? I just really got the sense, well, maybe they don't look like organic forms at all. Maybe they're, they're geometric. I kept getting that sense when I was doing this piece that this almost has a, a living kind of quality to it. So, all right. This drawing on linen, ink, and graphite, um, it's one of my ideal mathematical space drawings. Uh, so you'll see the diminution of space here as it moves back towards the horizon line. And perspective is quite simply ideal mathematical space. Geometry can work in such a way as to create the illusion of space on a flat surface. And I think this is a pretty good example of that. I was going to oil paint this, but I don't think I'm going to. I really like the way that it looks as a drawing and I'm going to keep it that way. And I think this will tie in well with our view out the back of my studio. This is the view outside my studio of both in Marsh here in Mill Valley. And it's quite a joy and a pleasure to be able to have uh, this view to look at every day, see the passage of the seasons, the 
natural uh, wildlife that comes through, uh, geese, birds, foxes, and it's quite a joy for me because I know there's geometry in a lot of the organic world, the natural world around us, but it, for me it's a, a welcome respite from all of the work that I do with my geometry to be able to stay in touch with and in tune with the natural world that's around us and hopefully we're not doing too much more to ruin the beauty that I see out here all the time. God willing, we'll be able to save this earth of ours. Thank you.